Good to see you guys. Um, now, <clears throat> tell me your names. What's your name? Judah. Pardon? Judah. Judah. Arthur. Arthur. Levi. Levi. Max. Max. Now, let me ask you. Sorry? Did I get it wrong? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. He's my brother. Oh, he's your brother. Okay, that's cool. That's the main thing. Let me ask you a question. Did you choose your names yourselves? No? Didn't you? Why not? You didn't want to choose? You didn't? Okay. Who chose your name? Yeah? My parents. Your parents? Are you sure about that? Yeah? What do you think? Pun? And God. And God. Yes, that's right. And your yeah, Jesus and God and your parents. That's right. Do you agree? do you agree? Do you think your parents chose your name? Yeah, I'm, my name. I've got three names: Jeffrey, Michael, Thomas, Macpherson. It never fits in an envelope, and that's because I was the last one. My parents. I was the eighth, and they knew they had to get all those names in that they had been saving up, so they just jammed them all into my name. Um, so my mum and dad chose chose my name. And um, so, okay, so your parents chose your name. Uh, did, let me ask you another question. Did your parents choose that you would all be boys? No? <laughs> no, they didn't, they? Eh? Yeah, yeah. Let me ask you another question. Did, he choose, did your parents choose what color your hair was going to be? No. What color your eyes were going to be? No. How what your shape, your tummy button would be? Did they choose that? No? Okay. <laughs> no, no, that's right. They didn't choose any of those things. Who chose? You said before. God chose, didn't he? God chose all those things. Why? Why do we know that? How do you know that? Yes. Very good. God created humans, man and woman, in his own image and in his own, own likeness, God made us. So God chose what color your hair was going to be, what color your eyes would be, and all of those parts about your handsomeness, God chose those. That's pretty cool, eh? Yeah. And so we're going to be talking about that tonight. Uh, well, I'm going to be opening up the book of Genesis and looking at how God has made us and what it means. What does it mean that God has made us, that and, and it has a lot of significance. It means that God chose who you would be and what you would look like and how you would act. That also God has put you here for a purpose, for a reason. Okay, God knows why you're here. And also that the fact that even though we know we can't please God like we should do, okay, Jesus Christ, our Savior, makes it possible for us to do that. So let me pray with you guys now. Lord, I thank you for the fact that you are the creator of everything and you have also made us in your image and in your likeness, as these guys have reminded me. We thank you that this is such a powerful truth because it shapes the whole of our lives. It, it shapes how we see the world. It shapes how we see ourselves, how we see others and what we understand our purpose, our reason for being here is all about. But we thank you above all that you have given us that one perfect man, the Lord Jesus Christ, to bring us into your presence and to make us acceptable to you. We thank you for Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. I want to invite you to turn with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 1. So Carlo finished off Titus for us last Sunday evening, and um, we're not adrift or anything, but we're just choosing other passages until um, Logan is back in a couple of weeks, and of course he will resume a preaching series, so we're just going to preach some one-off uh, messages over the next couple of weeks. So Genesis chapter 1, I'm going to read from verse 1. Oh, this is on page 1 too. I knew I'd get that one. Unless there's something seriously wrong with your Bible. It's page 1. 
Um, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, listen to God's word. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there's what, there was evening, and there was morning the first day. God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. Let it separate the waters from the waters. God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse, and it was so. God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good, and God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, each according to its kind, on the earth, and it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, according to their own kinds, and the trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years and let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the great two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens and gave light on the earth to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let Birds fly above the earth, across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarm, according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind, and God saw it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the, in the seas, and let, the bir let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day, and God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with its seed and its fruit, and you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, Everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Amen. May God bless to us that reading from his word. Let us uh, ask God to help us as we open the Bible together. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. 
And we thank you for the anchor that it is to our soul, <clears throat> how it places us in this universe. And we pray that you tonight would help us to receive your word with faith and that you would bring about transformation in our lives by the inner work of the Spirit of God. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Just after Christmas, we had to uh, take our cat for a long sleep. And um, like every cat-loving person, I rang the vet, and I had one important question I wanted to ask the vet. How much does it cost to put a cat down? Now we really, our cat climber, she was a lovely cat, been a wonderful blessing and comfort to our family, and also latterly to Jeff and Jaya. She basically abandoned us and adopted Jeff and Jaya um, because they are living in the flat behind us. Um, 16 years old, blind, and uh, having difficulty. And I was kind of taken aback when the lovely vet person at the end of the phone not only told me one place how much it would cost, um, but uh, when they said, oh, to, to euthanize your cat, this is how much it will cost. And I was kind of a little bit taken aback by the use of that word euthanize. Now, I know that we don't believe in euthanizing humans, but typically that's how we tend to use that word. And I was sort of brought, maybe brought up to speed a little bit as to how society and how vet clinics think about animals and, and about pets. And it sort of got me pondering, like, are we going to get to a point where, <clears throat> you know, I'm going to have to get a certificate, I'm going to have to get permission from someone if I want to take my cat to the vet um, to, to be put down? Uh, are we going to get to that point where people are going to say, you know, what right do you have to put down a cat? And, it, and of course, it opens up that much bigger question, which is sort of out there in society, isn't it? Which is, what is it that makes it right for me as a human being to take my cat to the vet to have my cat put down and why can't a cat do that with me? What, you know, what's the difference? What right do I have to do that with a cat? And what is it that makes me different, makes me special that I can do this to an animal? And, 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 and of course, this is a, a big question, and it's becoming more and more of a complex question, isn't it, in, in society as we move further and further away from holding to what we would see as a, a biblical view of ourselves, a biblical view of humanity, of who we are and why we are here and why we exist. And, and when you um, start exploring people's thought on this matter, you come across very differing views. I don't know if you've experienced this. If you were to say to people, um, who are you or what are you, there is one, one side that kind of says, I'm a prince or a princess of the universe, and everything exists for me. So uh, the universe exists for my good and my pleasure and my comfort and my advancement in life. And so I do what I need to do to make my life successful and, and, and good. And, and that's all that matters. That's one kind of view. Then on the other hand, you've got the view which sort of is like, well, I'm just a a random speck of dust, you know, in the, in the vast universe. There's no real reason why I'm here. Um, I'm, there's no purpose. There's nothing different or significant about me. There's been, it's like, you know, opening a, a door into a room that's full of dust and you see all the specks of dust floating around. And there's nothing unique. There's nothing special about me compared to all the other animals, all the other creatures and all the um, others who have been before me. And so we, we sort of, you have these really very differing views of what it means to be a person, what it means to be a human, what is a human, why are we here, and, and, and what is our purpose in, in life, what, why do we exist? And this, this whole discussion, of course, is becoming even more complex these days, isn't it? Through the way that people now talk about themselves. 
um, in his book on uh, the rise and triumph of the modern self, Carl Truman, he has this opening statement where he says, you know, 30 years ago, when my, if someone had, if my grandfather had heard someone say, I am a woman trapped inside a man's body, he said, my grandfather would just would not have even understood that that was a sentence, that was a like a rational kind of comment. But he is saying that today, if someone says that, you know, I'm I'm a woman trapped inside a man's body, everyone to go, wow, it's thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, let's talk about this and let's celebrate this and you know, let's do some, let's, you know, do a party or something like that. And, and again, that is coming out of that whole confusion about what does it mean to be a human being? Who is it that defines who you are? Who is it that says you're special? And who is it that says you're a man or a woman, you're, 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 you're someone unique in the first place? And these kinds of questions, though, haven't, they're not necessarily new questions. If you look at Genesis chapter 1, we know that Genesis is written by Moses. And it's written by Moses after the, as the people of Israel leave Egypt and they are heading for the promised land. So that they have been, for over 400 years, they have been, first of all, refugees and then slaves in Egypt. And now they're heading for the promised land. And Egypt, like all the nations around them, what is their, their view of life? Well, they are polytheistic, meaning they believe in many gods, many gods and goddesses, many deities. For example, uh, one belief was this, this story of Inamu Elish, which was an ancient Mesopotamian story that said there was one god attacked a goddess and humans were born out of that attack and that humans really just exist as kind of like um, slaves and, you know, just sort of, housekeepers and live-in workers just to do all the stuff that the gods and the goddesses can't be bothered doing themselves. So that's a great view of, of what it means to be a human, doesn't it? We're just here just to tidy up after all the gods and goddesses. And we're kind of semi-accidental and we're, we're, we're a result of violence and, and sin and evil. And so when Moses writes Genesis chapter 1, what is he doing? He's showing God's people that this is not the case. You're not accidental. You're not something that has just been come out of existence uh, because of gods and goddesses and conflict and sin. But humans have been created by an all-powerful loving God for a specific purpose and for a reason. That is, what, that is what Genesis is telling us, and that's what the whole of the Bible tells us. And it's really important for us to hear that because just as in Moses' day when the, you know, the people of Israel were surrounded by all these um, weird and, and uh, erroneous views of life and what it means to be a human, <clears throat> so we also, today, we're equally surrounded by false views of what it means to be human. Um, evolutionary theory has become very pervasive and so... Today, most people have an understanding that they simply have come to be the um, bipedal, meaning you walk on two feet. Um, that's really just something evolution has kind of done, and that you are sentient, you can think. You're puzzling in your mind right now. Where's Jeff going to go with this? I hope he doesn't take too long. Did I have what I'm going to have for tea afterwards? Or maybe you're puzzling, you know, what is the... What is the answer to the meaning of the universe? Is it 42 or do we even know the question at all? This is Hitchhiker's Guide stuff for those of you who don't know. Um, you know, it, that sentience, is that just a fluke? Is that just a random fluke of, of the universe that somehow humans have this ability to think and reflect and look inside themselves? And, and that's how so many, that's how so many of us are being trained and taught and and, and, and um, encouraged to think about life, to see life. And so it's really important. It's vital that if we're going to be able to help people to understand why are you here, who are you, and 
can you be someone trapped inside the wrong body as some sort of accident of, 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 of evolution? How do we answer these people? How do we answer ourselves? And how do we answer um, the society around us, the world around us? And the Bible gives us the answers to these kinds of questions. Um, it, it's something that we don't find in ourselves. We find only in the Word of God because God himself is the one who provides the answers because the Word of God is something that is deeply, radically different from how we um, make the world seem and how we want to answer these questions. So, Genesis 1, verse 26, God said, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, <clears throat> After our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So the way I want to sort of try and deal with this tonight and, and use Genesis here to, well, to unfold Genesis is that, first of all, what Genesis tells us is that um, God alone says who you are. I think that's the first truth that we take out of Genesis. God alone says who you are. In other words, your identity is something that is God-given. It's defined by God. It's not defined by randomness. It's not defined by your culture. It's not defined by science even. And it's certainly not defined by yourself, that you cannot, you cannot choose your identity. Your identity is something that God alone chooses. God says who you are. And this was a question that the question of who I am and where I come from and why I am here is, is I think, bit, put way better than I could ever put it in Psalm 8. Some of you are familiar with Psalm 8. This is the psalm where the psalm writer is looking at the heavens and, and uh pondering the majesty of the heavens in Psalm 8, verse 3. He says, when I look up at your heavens, he's speaking to God, when I look up at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor, and you have given him dominion over all the works of your hands and put all things under his feet. And so the psalm writer is putting that question out, not because the psalm writer doesn't know the answer, but he's asking it, isn't he? He's contemplating what God has made. He's contemplating the majesty of, of who God is and what God is doing. And so he's kind of like thinking, who am I? You know, it'd be kind of like when you get invited to something and you think to yourself, man, why did they invite me? That, that's pretty random. Like, that must be a mistake. I, I shouldn't be on this list, you know. And, and that's the way that the psalm writer, he's looking at the universe and he's like, wow, how, does it, how is it that God even knows about me? How is it that God even cares for me? How is it that God even has a thought of me? And yet he does. And, the, and he, then he proceeds to give that answer, which is, you know, God, you, God knows about you because God has created you. God is the one who has made you in the first place. That, is the, that very fact in and of itself gives you significance. It, it shapes your identity. Your identity is something that is, has its origin in God and, 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 and um, is found in God alone. And so when you look at Genesis 1, God says, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. So here you have this incredible... Um, depiction of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in, how do we say it? Divine conversation as they commune together in perfection 
and absolute wisdom as they determine that they will create human beings in their own image, in their own likeness. Let us make man in our image, in after our likeness. And so it's not like you may be waiting for the punchline of that point, but that is the point. The point is, is that your identity has its origin in the mind of God himself. You're not a fluke. You're not chance mutations. You're not the process of, you know, billions and billions of years and all of that kind of stuff. You are something that has been determined. You are created by God according to his mind, according to his purpose, according to his holy will. You are perfect in the mind of God because a perfect God has created you. And Psalm 8 sort of unfolds that a little bit more where it goes on and says, you know, um, you have made me a little lower than the angels and crowned him with glory and with honor. Crowned him with glory and with honor. And that, what is that is pointing to is the fact that <clears throat> as a human being today, you can unashamedly, without sounding like you're blowing your own trumpet and saying how wonderful I am, as a human being, you can say, I am unique. I am different. I, I am not like, I love cats, but I'm not like a cat. I'm better than a cat. I love dogs, but I'm better than a dog. I love sheep, I'm, but I'm better than a sheep or a salamander or whatever it is. There is something about a human being that is different. Now, we know it's really highlighted by that phrase in, in Psalm 8 where it says he's created that God has made us to have glory and honor. So God gives us this place of glory and honor in the universe that no other creatures have. No other creatures have that place. N nothing else is ever described in that way. Even a peacock with a beautiful tail or whatever, you can think of the most incredible creature, a blue whale or whatever it is. None of these are ever described as having glory and honor or as being a little lower than the angels. And that is the way God designed us and made us. It's not as if when he's saying about a little lower than the angels, God was like, I want to make some angels and whoops, mess that one up. Well, I've ended up with human beings. Oh, well, that's sort of good enough. Not quite angels. That's no, not what he's saying. That God has made us like that. That was his purpose. That was his design. And of course, it's highlighted even further by that little phrase that you would have seen. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And we don't have time to go to in, into all the permutations of that. But what it is really pointing to, again, is the fact that we have been created by God to represent God upon the earth uh, in many ways. Our ability to think, our ability to relate, uh, but above all, as we see in the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who was incarnated in the flesh, it's not something that stops at the fall. Yes, God says it here, but he says it again in Genesis 5 after the fall, and he says it again in Genesis chapter 9 after the flood. We still are image bearers of God, even though that image has somehow been cracked and is damaged. We still are. We still remain image bearers of God. And so what it is saying is that these creatures are special we stand out from all the others. I've got a niece who's helped make some movies and some quite big, well-known movies. And um, she does costuming. And she'll say, oh, I worked on that movie. If you wait, like if you're the last person in the movie theater, you might see my name flash across the screen um, amongst all the hundreds of other names um, because I you know, just made some of the costumes or something like that or did some of the CGI. It's not like that with us humans. It's like the movie finishes and it's straight away. It's that pride of place. God is saying glory and honor. These human beings, they have a special place. They are made in my image, in my likeness. They are my handiwork. I have made them. As Psalm 
100 verse 3 says, It is he who made us and we are his. We are his, his people, the sheep of his pasture. And the practical application of this, brothers and sisters, is, is that when you th- ask that question, then who am I? Please don't ask it of the internet. Don't ask Google. Don't ask YouTube. Don't ask TikTok. Please don't ask those things. Don't even ask Tay Tay. Okay? Don't even ask Richie McCaw. Okay? Only God can give you that answer. God says who you are. Only God defines who you are tonight. So if God has created us, then why has he made us? If God has made us and this is, this is what our identity is, then why is it that God has made us? <laughs> I, I love those you know, children's story Bibles that say, why did God create humans? It's like, well, God was kind of lonely and wanted company, you know, wanted someone to talk to, so he created man and woman, you know. That's... It's kind of blasphemous, and it's totally wrong. But it's kind of cute as well, but it's, it's not right. It's wrong. Um, God doesn't create us because of anything lacking in and of himself, but he creates us for his worship and for his glory. And so that's the second thing I want to say that this passage highlights for us, is that you exist for worship. The, your purpose, your reason for your existence is for the worship of God. Let us make man, verse 26, in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock. Verse 27, created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. You see, materialism, the world that we, are, that we sort of live in is really soaked, isn't it, in this idea which is that pretty much life is what you want to make of it, isn't it? That we're, we're, that's what we're told, isn't it? That's what life coaches and, and motivational speakers will tell you. Life is what you want to make out of it. And, and didn't they, somebody make a, a, sing a song? Life's what you make it, talk, talk, something like that. Um, That's not true. You don't determine your purpose in life. Here it says, God creates us, why? For a purpose, to be fruitful and to multiply and have dominion over his creation. So God gives humans, and and, um, theologians talk about the fact that he gives us a a cultural mandate. He gives us a, a command or a mandate to exercise rule over his creation, a care for his creation. But we are to exercise care in the way that God has determined we should do that. And we see the sort of the, um, we see where it goes bad, eh? In Genesis chapter 3, God says, you know, rule over creation and have dominion over it. And, 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 and this is my creation and you're to do it my way. And then Adam and Eve say, Nah, I think we've got a better plan. We've worked it out, God. We've got this. We know how to do this. And we see how badly that goes. What do the first humans do? They, they exercise something we call autonomy, self-rule. And they say, we're going to do it our way, and it crashes and burns. But if you look at Psalm 8 again, there the psalm writer ex- expands on what it means to be someone who rules over God's creation. He says, you have given him dominion, notice this, over the works of your hands. Now, that's, that's implicit in Genesis, isn't it? Like, God has just created everything, and then he says, have dominion over my creation, not over your creation. But the psalm writer makes it explicit, doesn't he? He says, you have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and ox and all the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is the name of humanity. No, he doesn't say that, does he? How majestic is your name in all the earth. You see, 
the psalm writer is saying, God, you've given human race, you've given man this responsibility of, of exercising dominion over your creation for your glory. How majestic is your name for your worship and for your praise. You see, we are created as image bearers because we are to represent God upon the earth in order to rule over God's creation. But we are not the rulers of creation. Lord of the Rings illustration alert, you know, um, Minas Tirith, you know, that amazing city. It's the city of the kings, isn't it? But in the Lord of the Rings, does a king rule and reign and minister? No, there are stewards who are there. And the stewards, Denethor, the steward, he is waiting for the return of the king, for the rightful ruler to come back. He's exercising his rule just as a temporary measure. And so it is with us. We are not kings and queens or princes or princesses of the universe but the king of the universe has appointed you and me to exercise dominion over his creation under him. That is the reason for your existence. That is, that is, that is why you are here. That's why you exist. That's your purpose in life. And to do that, of course, in a way that glorifies God, we know can be described in no other way but as an act of, of worship. Our, our um, stewardship is, is for God's glory. It's under his authority. And so it is that we do this as an act of worship. It's not about us. It's about God, isn't it? So we exist because God has brought me into existence. I exist because God has brought me into existence. And my reason for existing is to point back to God, to give glory to God as my creator. And that is pretty opposite, wouldn't you say, from the way a lot of society and our culture thinks now, isn't it? It's sort of like, again, we, we, we're in a society and we're in a culture that says, life's what you make it and you need to get the most out of it. How are you going to how are you going to live a successful life? How are you going to live a fulfilling life? Well, you need to do lots of stuff. You need to fill up your life with is it money? Money is that going to make you feel good about yourself? Then get money. Is it sex? Sex going to make you feel good about yourself? Then get sex. Is it fame? It, then get fame. Whatever it, whatever it takes, get fame. And and what are we doing? What are we doing when we do this? We are not worshipping our creator, are we? We're worshipping ourselves. Just like Adam and Eve did in the garden. We worship ourselves. That is not how we are to live. That is not why we're here. God has made us, and he has made us to worship him. Man's chief end. What is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to... Glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Those old people knew something, didn't they? Westminster divines. Or as Paul says in Romans 12, that we are to present ourselves, present your bodies as living sacrifices. When Paul is saying that, he's saying present yourself, everything about you as a living sacrifice, as an act of worship to God, which is your reasonable service. Which, of course, then raises this really obvious and ugly question, which is, Jeff, <laughs> I can't do that, can I? Look at me. You don't know my heart. You don't know my life. You don't know what motivates me, what drives me in life. And I'm pretty sure it's not entirely what God has in mind for me. That's, the, that's that fallen human sin condition. Yes, you are still made in God's image, but that image has been marred. It's been damaged. And we're called to, and yes, we are called to serve God and to worship Him by exercising dominion over His creation. But how much can you really rule? It's it's pretty feeble, isn't it? You think about how much control you have. Control over the universe? No. 
control over the old asteroid that's going to fly a bit close to the Earth? No. Control over your dog or your cat? Yeah, maybe a little bit. Control over yourself? Sometimes, but usually not. Control over Satan? Uh -uh. And so we immediately realize that we've got this problem. God has made us, and he has made us to glorify him by worshiping him, by exercising dominion, and yet we realize that there is something seriously wrong. And that is why when you, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with that passage in Acts chapter 17, maybe it's helpful to turn there. This is the Apostle Paul in Athens. So Athens was like, you know, the university city of the day, and that's where all the uh, brainy people hung out and debated stuff um, and asked deep questions. And he's preaching to these guys at the Areopagus because um, he spots this altar to the unknown God. And he says in his sermon, in verse 26, and he, that's God, made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. And yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, even as one of your own poets has said, have said, for indeed we are indeed his offspring. And so what the Apostle Paul is, is calling these, these people to do, he's saying, God has made you, you know, you, in him you live and move and have your being, but you know and I know that our hearts are not right, that we're not living the way God wants us to live, that we are not, we're not serving God the way God wants us to serve, and we're not living life um, for the purpose that God wants us to live life. And in fact, as, Roman, as Paul says in Romans chapter 3, you, you know, there is none righteous, not even one. There is no one who even seeks after God. We've gone away from God. And so we have this terrible predicament. It's, it's a really horrible situation to be in. And it's, it's your problem and my problem. And it's a daily problem. It's not a philosophical problem, brothers and sisters. It's not a theological problem, so to speak. You won't, it's not something you just find in a, systematic theology book, but it's a life problem that every one of you, and myself included, we face every day. Every day you open your eyes and you're faced with this problem. God has made me. He has made me to worship him, but my heart is far from him. My heart doesn't want to worship him. My heart wants to worship me today. Okay? And that's the problem, isn't it? And Paul, say, uh, Paul says to the, the folks there that we should seek God. We are made as his image bearers. It's not right that we should be living like this. And of course, that is why we have the Lord Jesus Christ. This is where it leads us to the gospel. I want to direct your attention to Romans chapter 5, five verse 15 as we start to wrap this up. Romans chapter 5, verse 15. Paul, in a couple of distinct, succinct verses, describes the problem and the solution. He says, For if many died through one man's trespass, who's the one man? Adam, okay? Yep, blame Adam, all right? Many died through one man's trespass, Adam and Eve sin in the garden, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. So Paul, what he's doing is he's comparing these, he talks about these two Adams. He's talking about a first Adam and a second Adam, and he says, first Adam stuffed things up real bad so that every day when you wake up, you've got a problem, human sin problem, which you are unable to solve yourself. You cannot fix it. But he says, the second Adam, the one man, Jesus Christ, has brought the free gift of grace, the grace of God, the free gift of eternal life, 
the free gift of a restored relationship, the free gift of sins forgiven, the free gift of a conscience cleansed from guilt, the free gift of hope, the free gift of being right with God and being justified by faith alone. That is what the second Adam brings. That is what the Lord Jesus Christ brings as the one who took to himself the unfallen flesh of humanity that God had created in the first place. By his perfect obedience, by his sacrificial death, the second Adam brings about an inner, transform an inner transformation so that when you wake up, and I, had a, I don't want to point to myself in any way, but I remember the day after I cried out and received God's mercy, I woke up in the morning and the very first thought that entered my head, this was a God-given thing, was if I'm going to do this for the rest of my life, I can only do this by God's strength that he provides. Have you ever had that thought? You know, you sometimes you think, oh, could I, could I quit being a Christian? Or maybe I'm not a Christian today. And then you realize, I can because of the spirit of Christ that was, is within me and the strength that he provides, the free gift of, of grace that is abundantly poured out by the Spirit of God upon the children of God. And so he brings about that inner tra transformation, that desire that takes us from being those who Paul says in Areopagus really are not seeking for God. As he says in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, no one is seeking after God. Suddenly you are seeking God. Why? Did you get really smart? Did you read some theology? Go to Grace Theological College? Hear amazing sermons? No, that's not why. Because the Holy Spirit has regenerated your heart, changed your heart. You've been born again. And so you now you seek after God, something that previously you were unable to do. And it gets even better. Just one, 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 other final one. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. Similar kind of statement. But this is about the... You know, the dessert, the good stuff to come, like don't get away your fork, you know, remember that illustration? Don't, don't put your, your spoon in the dishwasher because there's more to come uh, sort of stuff. That's a really cheesy Christian illustration. Well, he says in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Again, he's contrasting the two Adams. Adam, what did Adam and Eve uh, bequeath to us. What was our inheritance from them? You know, what did our mum and dad leave for us? They left death, eternal death, and eternal separation from God. But as in Adam all died, so in Christ shall all be made alive. Paul is talking about the resurrection. He's talking about something that will never be taken away, something which is eternal and, and lasts forever and ever and ever. In a million years, it will still be ongoing. In a billion years, it will be just beginning. As an Adam will die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. So it's a challenge for us, a challenge for myself to think about my identity and how that is shaped it's so easy, isn't it, to be shaped by the pressures around us. It's so easy to be shaped by the cultural influences, by the things we hear and see and the conversations we have and the stuff we read. Probably more and more these days, it used to be what we see on TV. Now it's what we watch on the internet, what we see on YouTube and all of that kind of stuff. We've been so much shaped by that and, 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 and so much of it is not true. So much of it is, is a lie. Our identity, our cultural identity is not something that we just shape ourselves or is random. Our sexual identity is not something that we just choose for ourselves. But everything about us is something that is shaped by God with a purpose, with a reason, for his glory, in his wisdom, his infinite wisdom, and for his, his glory. And it's only as we come back to the scriptures and only as we 
dig into the scriptures and only as we study passages like this passage here in Genesis that we are able to correct those malign influences that the surrounding world has upon us and give ourselves a biblical and a godly view of ourselves because God has made us and why we are here and how we can correct that problem. Only God has the solution for your sin problem. Let's pray. Lord, we're reminded of that prayer your saint of old, Saint Augustine, prayed when he said, Lord, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. And so, Lord God, it is indeed true that you are the center of the universe and you have created us with glory and honor in your image and likeness. That is our origin. That is our identity. And you have created us for the purpose of worship. We thank you tonight that through Christ Jesus we are able to fulfill the purpose you have upon our lives and we are able to realize our true identity as we are transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We thank you in his name. Amen.